Greetings. My name is Martha Knox, although I'm sure many of you know that by now. And I'm here to tell you a story. The story of my father, John Knox, and Mary, Queen of Scots, who some have called his greatest earthly enemy. My father was not a particularly brave or even strong man. In fact, he was quite the opposite. I would often see him before preaching a sermon, struggling with this spirit that seemed to crush him and torment his soul. And yet the Lord worked through him mightily. So much so, he became known as the Thundering Scot. And he had a profound impact on my early life as well. It seemed that I had inherited his worrying nature, but was not nearly as effective in battling it as he was. I spent many a day struggling with this great fear, and I felt my usefulness in his ministry was greatly hindered because of it. But the story I'm about to share with you is one he told me many years ago. It changed my life, and I pray it will change yours as well. He told me to always remember that no matter how dark our circumstances are, or how bleak the horizon seems, the Lord will use those who are faithful to him for his purpose and for his plan. Dear brother in the faith, the blood of my friends is being spilt as I speak. We are witnessing the end of Scotland as we know it. The simple preaching of God's truth is causing people to take up arms. All has been tied up in the evil workings of that female fiend, Mary, Queen of Scots. I have sinned in my hateful thoughts towards her when I should be on my knees praying for her salvation. I pastor my little flock as best I can with the strength that the Lord has given me. My dear James, visit me as soon as possible that I may give you certain documents and books that would greatly aid your ministry in England. I do not know how many days are yet granted me on this earth. What is it? What is it, my dear? We, we heard shouting and gunshots outside and she became frightened. And was she the only one? I, I wasn't frightened. I was only concerned for the children. That's not true, Martha. When the soldiers started shooting, you jumped up and screamed. Hell yeah, We must never be ashamed to admit our weakness. There's nothing wrong with being frightened. Only in forgetting to put our trust in God and letting our mind worry. Yes, Papa. But why is God allowing this to happen to us, Pa? We serve him faithfully. We strive to obey his commands, remain true in everything. And yet he still sends persecution as though he wishes to crush us further. Not crush us, Martha. He uses trials to shape and mold us into his image. As it says in his word, the testing of our faith produces endurance. But I still don't understand. Why does the queen sit on her throne, proud and prosperous, devising schemes for the devil while we serve him and we suffer? The Lord has placed her there for his purposes, and she cannot move to the right or to the left without him knowing. So how does God get to us, Papa? I do not know, my dear. I pray that we'll be safe, but we are in our heavenly Father's care. And that is the best place to be. And now, George, are you frightened as well? I need a lesson on the sovereignty of God. <laughs> I can always hear a lesson, Master Knox. But I've come to relieve you of your little family and take them to supper. We will go at once. Come, children. Don't take us from Papa Martha, please. It is all right, Martha. The children need their Papa at the moment. Oh, but your work. It will keep. In fact, why don't I tell you all a story 
And like all good stories, this one comes with a lesson as well. What will you hear this time, little ones? Tell us a story about a queen pavilion in a beautiful land with jewels and gold. Oh, Margaret, there's nothing wonderful about a queen. In fact, we'd be a great deal better without one. I can tell you a story about a queen, but as Martha says, it is not at all a pleasant one. Ha! Ah, would you happen to be in that story, Master Knox? You have guessed well, George. Perhaps you should tell it since you also were there. Much help I was. You were there? Hi. I remember it well. The queen had just been cornered. <laughs> and one of the first things she did was ban the preaching of God's word. She forced everyone to attend mass and made it quite clear that she would tolerate no protest on the subject. And what did you do? He protested. Why am I not surprised? Ah, he preached a sermon exposing the wickedness of such a decree. That the Lord would make his will known to me as to how I should proceed. And what did the queen do? In a terrible rage, she summoned me to her court. Quite. Needless to say, she was not flattered by all the attention. I entered the Queen's court, which was a very splendid room. There she was, waiting with all her foppish lords and ladies crowded around her, and I was disgusted by it all. But I had come to tell her the truth, and I could not turn back. thundering Scott has written about me. Indeed, Your Majesty. Yeah. Sully my mind by actually reading it. It is pure sedition. The man is inciting rebellion and must be stopped. That he should have the gall, the audacity to challenge me, his queen. Say, I'm quiet. did not dare refuse my summons. I believe he's here now. I must tell the truth. 
Hey, that is what I'm afraid of. So you are John Knox. This is the man whose prayers my mother feared above an army. He does not seem so terrible. And yet his pen certainly can be. I have read your poisonous pamphlet, which you so cunningly aimed at me. It is an article of great sedition and slaughter and has already caused much damage. I believe you are part sorcerer, indeed I do. For you bend men's minds against their lawful sovereign and teach them babble and treasonous talk. What have you to say for yourself, you child of evil? Would you attempt to take my crown from me? Would it please your majesty to patiently hear my answers? I have been sent by God to expose the heresy of the Catholic Church and to preach his true word. In this I have done no wrong. Then you think that I have no just authority? You think that my subjects ought to do what you say and not what I command? That I must be subject to them and not them to me? That is against all the natural order of things, and that I will not have. God forbid that I ever command anyone to obey me. No, my counsel is that both kings and subjects obey God in all things. That is why I wrote the book against you. For you have overstepped the bounds that God has placed for you. But you are not of the church that I am a part of. I will defend the church of Rome, for I think it the true church, and those who go against it to be in great error. Shall I not expose your heresy, Master Knox? Shall I not warn my subjects against it? If you have fallen into such grievous thinking, that is indeed a great tragedy. For you to attempt to force all those under you to go against their conscience will ensure you the greatest judgment. How dare you threaten me? You, a traitor against the queen. I'm no traitor. Indeed you are, for you command people to receive another religion other than their queen allows. And how can that be the doctrine of God, since it is he who commands people to obey their rulers? Madam, the right religion takes authority from the eternal God alone. If all the apostles should have been of the religion of the Roman emperors, what Christianity would there have been in the world? Yes, but none of these men raise their swords against their princes. Yet you cannot deny they existed. I do not deny that they resisted, but I ask you now, do you condone the violence that you have incited? I do not encourage violence. But if rulers exceed their bounds, no doubt they may be resisted. Men must not disobey God. They must resist or flee elsewhere to avoid confrontation. So you think me a monster then? A ruler who would drive her people away? I know you do. You think me unfit to rule. I think you placed on the throne by God for a space of time. But with respect, I do not agree with certain methods with which you govern the nation. How dare you tell me how to rule my country? But I know your real objection. You think that women have no right to rule, that they are inferior, and that they are forbidden to wear a crown. I do not say that, madam. Though the scriptures speak plainly, about women in control of the church. Then what of my conscience? Would you have me go against what I think is right? Conscience, madam, requires knowledge, and right knowledge, I fear you have none. But I have both heard and read the word of God. So did the Jews, and look how miserably they were mistaken, even to the extent of slaying the Son of God. But you interpret the scriptures in one manner, and the Pope in another. Whom then shall I believe? Who shall be judge? You should believe God, and him alone. He speaks plainly in his word, and if you were to pray earnestly and study it for yourself, you would soon see the error of your ways. You are too hard for me. I cannot answer you, but if the ones who had taught me were here, the great doctors and bishops, they would answer you, and you would have nothing to reply. They were here, 
I would share with them the word of God. Well, perchance, you may have the opportunity you crave sooner than you believe. For if you are summoned before the tribunal, you will be shown as the heretic and traitor that you are. If I am summoned to die for my faith, that I will gladly do. You are mad. You lead the people against me and my rule. Only because the laws that you make are utterly contrary to God and his word. Master. How dare you threaten me? I will have you know that I am the queen and that no one defies me. No one, not even you. Master, where should we going? I will tell you the truth, my lady. That if you would but read the word of God, I pray earnestly that he would open your heart. You'd have a different mind. The Holy Spirit, who is never contrary to himself, will convict the heart so that there can be no doubt except for those who remain in willful ignorance. <laughs> Would you insult a queen before her entire court? I never take delight in the weeping of any of God's children. May the Lord have mercy on you. Well, because the Lord had not allowed my time to come yet. The Lord holds us in the palm of his hand. Yes, my lad. He does. Even now? Even now. Now, children, you must run along. Excuse me. Run along. George, would you take them? Hi. Come on. Uh, Martha. Papa? Never forget, my lass. The Lord will never leave you nor forsake you. You're his own child, and even as a father corrects and trains his children, so our Heavenly Father does the same with us. I will try to remember, Papa. Oh, but it's so hard if we don't know what will happen or what our future will be. But we know who controls the future, alas. And that is our greatest comfort. You have many worries, child. I've noticed your concern these past months. Yes. And the more I try not to worry, I fear I worry more. You're not letting the Lord take it, lass. Let it go. Do not fear, for the Lord will never leave you nor forsake you. Yes, yes, Papa. His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you for reminding me, Papa. I, I do feel better now. That's my last. Now go and would you post this letter to James for me? Yes, of course. Thank you, Lassie. And hurry back, for you and George have a lesson with me in Greek. I, I have not forgotten. Yes, there is more studying to do. Always more studying to do. My father died of natural causes on November 24, 1572. In his will he wrote, None have I corrupted, none have I defrauded. Merchandise I have not made. 
throughout his life. He was a shining example of how the Lord will use even the weakest of us for his glory. Not only was he a mighty preacher of God's word, he was also a major part in the Reformation, both Scotland and in Switzerland. He was one of the composers of the Geneva Bible and translated many hymns and psalms into Scots Gaelic. The effects of his work are still felt in Scotland, Switzerland, and among believers everywhere to this very day. Thank you for hearing my story. I hope it has changed you as it changed me. their hour tonight they need to get into their wee beds um so we're going to do the displays prizes right now and then what's going to happen is uh leah is going to come and talk very briefly and then we're going to have uh the singing of a psalm which was very important back then and then we're going to have a talk about who john knox was so Let's uh, just invite uh, Ed and Debbie Braun, who judge these uh, exhibition displays, history fair. So this is, this is something we have done for the past four years. Is this the fourth year or is this the third year? Fourth. It's the fourth year. And these are the displays. They're going to tell you each, they'll tell you about them and who did them and whatnot. Will the artists of these wonderful posters please come up here and step, stand behind your poster. So. Atkinson family. Seth isn't here tonight, is he? Okay. And uh, this young lady here, Nicole Davis, and the Roland team, the Russell team. Thank you. So like Roland said, Debbie and I had the privilege of, uh, and the honor of judging these posters. And a lot of work went into it, and thanks for your hard work, folks. And I trust during the Jeopardy game, you learned a lot about it as well. What was what the contents contents of the posters was? Now, no particular order. We'd like to uh, recognize the artists here. First of all, we have this one over here by Abby and Amy. It's an absolutely beautiful presentation with uh, creative use of colors and materials to reflect the femininity of those important women of the Reformation. So, way to go! First prize, child category. Next, we have um, family category, the B Street by the Atkinson family. Thank you, Fox, B Street area. This work is a great effort, including uh, participation of all the children in the family. They couldn't all be here, but they did all partake. The handmade illuminated manuscript here is a beautiful example of how the uh, B Street, is that right? was applicable to Christianity prior to the Reformation. But it, uh, thanks for that there. Second prize in family category. Thank you. 
the places of John Knox by Seth uh, is a well-balanced, easy to interpret display indicating great research. And it was a, it was a nice, nice flow, a nice conductivity from past to present with information, dates, and maps. Thanks, uh, Seth, and that was first prize in the teen category. We're handing out the evaluation sheets as we go, in case you're wondering what Deb's doing. Now, this one you may have seen most of the time from this side, but the really eye-catching front is what we're going to describe here. Uh, Nicole Davis, thanks for this poster, which really pops out, capturing the interest of the observer. What is it all about? Well, the back of the poster holds the answers, outlining some of the pertinent characters and the roles they played in the dramatic event of the Reformation. First prize, adult category. And then by the Russell gentlemen, we have a war at the time of Reformation. Uh, this is an excellent presentation of very professional quality with eye-appealing colors. I really like the title here. Is that blood red there? Uh, the project outlines the interrelational aspects of uh, war and the Reformation, and that earned you first prize in the family category. Congratulations. <laughs> now, there are prizes for these uh, artists, but if you meet me back at the welcome desk, Deb and I will give you a choice of prizes. And uh, we're looking forward to, uh, to the next year's participants, so if you're thinking of an idea, and we would like to see many more posters. So there's a challenge for you guys for next year. All right. Thanks for your hard work. As you can see, in entering in the... the um, this history fair, it's topics from all over the period. And uh, we encourage you to look at all different aspects. I remember um, Joel Hovland doing one on prisons, which was quite interesting. And, and so many different things. You don't have to necessarily do it on people of the Reformation, although that has been done. And it is uh, an amazing to see God's faithfulness and how times don't change a whole lot in some respects. Leah is going to just going to say a quick word, and then we're going to sing the old 100th, if you're familiar with it. So thank you guys for um, watching our little production here. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope it taught you some things about John Knox and about the Reformation and things. I would just like to give a huge, huge thank you to the cast and the crew who put so much time and effort and um, you know, took time out of their week to come to practices and stuff like that. That was huge, so thank you very much. Let's give them all a huge round of applause. So that was great. Thank you also to um, Caitlin, who did a amazing, amazing job of doing all the behind-the-scenes stuff and being in charge of that and her crew. That was great. And also to um, Josh, who did like the partitions and stuff like that. That was amazing, and we couldn't have done it without you guys. And also, one thing I wanted to say quickly is that um, Chuck Smith was going to be part of this production, and he was unable to make it because he had uh, a medical surgery. So he can't be here tonight. But I don't know if he's watching on live stream or uh, anything like that. But I just want to let you know he was going to be here. So if we could all just give him a round of applause on the live stream. Because he was the director. He was actually the director for this production. And he you know, made sure everyone was in the right spot and stuff like that. And if he hadn't been involved, it would never have happened. So we really miss him tonight. And thankfully, um, my dad was able to fill in. Um, for him, and so <laughs> we're really happy for that too, otherwise it wouldn't have happened either. So thank you everyone um, for watching.
watching the play about John Knox, and we'll see you all next year. Have a great evening.